Hi guys, thank you for joining me again today for another question and answer video. I'm Ian, this is Forgotten Weapons of course, and uh, as usual we will be answering some questions here uh, that were submitted by a few of the folks who are among those wonderful people who help contribute to my Patreon account, which is a big part of what allows me to do this work regularly and bring you guys cool stuff all the time. So uh, I do want to point out a couple of the questions I got were very good but also very in-depth and detailed, and there are a couple subjects that I'd like to tackle on their own rather than trying to lump them into a composite video like this one. So, uh, Edward L., you asked something about German Universal Machine Gun programs, that in particular I would like to spend some more time researching and, and do something independently on that subject. Excellent question, not something that I feel like I have the time to try and get into in this video, but it will be coming later. Uh, anyway, we do have a bunch of questions here that uh, we will be getting to today, and we're going to start off with a question from a fellow named PHP. It says, I would like to know more about the original Rollin White revolver. Why did he patent the board through cylinder before the invention of metallic cartridges? How did his gun work? It's a good question. In 1855, when Rollin White uh, got his patent approved, there really weren't metallic cartridges, and his gun wasn't intended to use them. Uh, what he was really concerned with, or trying to do with his patent, was come up with a mechanism for having a magazine of paper cartridges that would automatically be loaded into the revolver cylinder when you cocked the hammer. That's, and, and so the board through cylinder was simply one necessary element of this idea he had for kind of like a self-loading revolver mechanism. Now it's also important, critically important really, to understand the story, to realize that Roland White's idea was terrible. It was not a good design, it would never have worked, uh, it was never manufactured. I believe one sample model was made at one point, which performed catastrophically um, for reasons we'll get to in just a moment. But what he he had this like a series of cog wheels and gears, and when you pulled the hammer back, it would push a thing a ramrod forward that would push a paper cartridge into the cylinder, and that's why the cylinder is bored through the back. If you had this mechanism in front of the cylinder, the cylinder gap is going to basically make it unavoidable that, that cylinder blast would detonate this magazine and set off these loose paper cartridges. So the magazine had to be behind the cylinder. As a result, you have to have the cylinder open at the back so that you can push a cartridge in. And from reading his patent, it seems like Rollin White spent so much time trying to figure out exactly how the magazine would work, and in particular, how you would seal off the magazine so that you wouldn't ever have the risk of a chain fire igniting the magazine. He spent so much time on that, he never really considered the fundamental operation of the gun itself, because there was no seal at the breech end of his system. Now, if you're looking straight on at the back of the cylinder, the way Rollin White's idea worked was that the magazine would load here at, say, the uh, 9 o'clock position, and then that cartridge would rotate up to the 12 o'clock position where it would fire. So he did have the back of the frame sitting behind that firing chamber, but as far as his patent describes, there is nothing to actually seal that except for like a close moving mechanical fit. Now at the same time, his cylinder design was specifically designated, or specifically uh, called for conical chambers that got narrower as you went forward. And the idea there was when you're loading this paper cartridge, uh, the projectile will fit in the back of the cylinder and the cylinder gets, or the chamber gets tighter and tighter and the ball, the projectile, will naturally come to a stop when it hits a tight fit, and thus, you know, ending your loading sequence. Uh, the problem is, with no breech seal on the gun, and a really tight fit on the projectile, if you were actually to fire this thing, uh, you would end up having some, if not most, if not virtually all, of the ejecting hot gas actually blow out the back of the cylinder, the back of the chamber, where it's unsealed, rather than push the projectile uh, through this effective forcing cone at the front of the cylinder and into the barrel. Uh, reportedly, uh, when he approached Colonel Colt about licensing this, uh, this patent or selling it to Colt or having Colt manufacture his guns, Colt took one look at this thing and, being the firearms expert that he was, realized pretty much immediately that, that this was an unworkable idea. It, the, literally, what was... <laughs> The only thing that was in there to effectively work as a seal at the breech was a piece of cardboard or fiber wad. That's it. Um, now there were a couple other issues with Rollin White's gun. Uh, he did not, again, because the back of the cylinder, or the back of the 
all the back of the cylinder and all the backs of the chambers are open, you don't have the typical position where you can put a percussion cap. And so instead of that, he had one percussion cap nipple mounted on the frame of the gun, and you would cock the gun, put on a percussion cap, fire the gun, cock it to rotate the cylinder and load a new cartridge in, or a new, a new paper cartridge, mind you. But then you'd have to actually take off the expended cap, if it didn't fall off, and place a new one on. So in addition to being fundamentally unworkable, this design also, even if it had magically worked somehow, would have been substantially slower than all the other guns on the market, uh, because you have to recap it for every single shot. So Colt took one look at this and went, uh, you know, hey, I, I love supporting, you know, new inventors and creative young people with interesting ideas, but this is useless. Um, and, and that was the end of that discussion. Um, and what came of it later was when Daniel Wesson went to patent the same feature, that board through cylinder. And remember, the board through cylinder was a fundamental part of Roland White's idea, just not for mechanical, or not for metallic cartridges. When Wesson went to patent that concept for the metallic cartridge, the patent office informed him that it conflicted with a patent that had already been approved and granted in 1855. That's what led Wesson to go talk to Rollin White and try and get rights to his patent, which he was able to do easily because Rollin White had already been told by one of the premier figures in the American firearms industry that his idea was worthless. Hey, someone shows up and wants to give you money for something that the best guy in the field has already told you isn't worth money, it's not going to take a whole lot of negotiation, probably. So uh, that's why, well, that's the answer to the question. That's, that's how Rollin White's gun in theory was supposed to work and how it didn't work and why he had that feature in it. Good question, by the way. Uh, next up, we have from Frank D. Why did pan-fed machine guns fall out of vogue after World War I? Open bolt belt fed machine guns have advantages and disadvantages the same as closed bolt pan fed systems, so why the universal move to belt fed? Uh, well, there wasn't necessarily a universal move to belt fed. Uh, there were magazine fed machine guns for quite some time. Uh, the Bren gun, of course. Uh, the Soviets, for example, went to, they went from a pan fed gun, the DP 28, to a belt fed gun, the RPD and then fairly quickly went back to a magazine-fed gun with the RPK. Um, there are other examples. World War II, there were a substantial number of magazine-fed guns. What really did fall out of vogue was specifically the pan magazine, this idea of a horizontal drum sitting on top of the gun. And I think really the, the prime reason for that was that those things are really awkward to carry. If you've got box magazines, it's not that big a deal to design some sort of pouch, web gear, system, for carrying a bunch of them. And they're easy to move and they stack nicely usually. The pan mags are just always a bit awkward. That round shape makes them clumsy and difficult just to carry. Um, I don't know if you've ever tried uh, carrying, for example, DP magazines. They have a couple, basically you end up with this big satchel that's gonna hold 150 rounds total worth, give or take. Um, and this kind of works either way for, for Lewis guns as well. That satchel could hold a substantially larger amount of ammunition were it in regular box magazines or belts or clips, for that matter, for a, a non-machine gun. Um, the, the pan really just didn't bring that much benefit. Now, I think the reason that you see the pan-fed functions often going to belt feed is that the one thing the pan did offer was typically a, a larger capacity than you could get in a box magazine, because that box magazine is going to, well, let's let's step back a moment. You're talking like 47 rounds in a pan magazine. If you make a 47 round box magazine, that's going to be a fairly long magazine. And it's going to either stick way up off the gun. Consider that typical um, top fed guns are going to have either 20 or 30 round magazines. So 50% taller than that. Or so far below the gun that you wouldn't be able to effectively use it prone or you'd be very high off the ground to do so. So when you're looking for a large capacity magazine, you first go to the pan, because it seems like an interesting idea, and then when you realize it's really awkward to work with, then you go to a belt, because it's the next best, in fact, it's the better way to get that large capacity. Uh, not only is it a lot easier to transport the ammunition for, uh, it's also, you don't have the awkwardness of the, the pan, and you actually get more capacity. 
Um, typical belts were usually either 100 or 250 rounds. So either double or quintuple the capacity of a typical pan magazine. Next up from Benjamin K. Why has the rounded pistol bullet, for example, 9x19 Parabellum, 45 ACP, uh, stayed popular? Considering innovations towards more sharply pointed bullets, wouldn't pistol rounds follow suit? For example, 5.7x28 uh, and become widely adopted. Now, this isn't something that I have put a substantial amount of specific research into, so I'm going out on a limb a little bit here, but I, I think I'm on pretty good ground. Um, two reasons. First of all, the pointed Spitzer bullet is primarily useful in something that is traveling supersonic, uh, which applies to virtually all rifle rounds, but not really so much to pistol rounds. Um, and pistol rounds drop subsonic before all that long. It's not like the supersonic... For, let me rephrase that. It's not like the aerodynamic drag is a substantial effect on a pistol bullet, because you're not generally expecting a pistol to have a particularly long range the way you do want to have a rifle bullet maintain an effective long range. So poor aerodynamics in a pistol round really isn't that big of a problem. At the same time, your pistol rounds are typically, they're larger in diameter than typical rifle rounds, and they're going to be designed to be fairly short. If you want to make if you want to make it that pistol round pointed, you actually lose a lot of the volume of the projectile because you go from this rounded uh, concave or convex, depending on how you're looking at it. You go from this large rounded projectile to a pointed one. If you look at a semicircle versus a triangle that are the same length, that semicircle has a lot more volume to it. That volume is what gives you bullet mass. Uh, I obviously I don't have the numbers in front of me, but if you were to take something like a 45 ACP and you wanted to maintain the same overall length so it'll fit in the same magazines, but you want to make it a pointed bullet, you're probably going to be looking at something like half, maybe two thirds of the projectile weight. Well, projectile weight is a sub significant uh, contributor to what makes handgun rounds work, so you don't really want to get rid of that. If you have the choice between having bullet weight in a pistol cartridge and having uh, supersonic aerodynamics in a pistol cartridge, the bullet weight is a much more useful thing to have. Now looking at the example uh, Benjamin gives here, the 5.7x28, yeah, that's a pointed bullet. I think a large part of that is because that cartridge was actually developed from the ground up, uh, with a major part of its utility being perforation of body armor. Um, and that required a bit of a longer bullet. You want to have an armor-piercing hardened core inside, that obviously works a lot better when it's pointed. Um, and because they were developing that round from scratch at the time, making the chamber a little bit longer so you can maintain the same projectile weight and have a nice point to it isn't a problem. Uh, it's more of a problem when you're taking an older round, perhaps something even that was designed around a s almost semi-circular lead, uh, lead projectile, taking that and trying to adapt it to a pointed projectile is a, a real different story. All right, moving on. JR says, I have seen the gyrojet rocket rounds and the trowns, which are triangular cartridges for the Dardic revolver, uh, but what other funky rounds have been manufactured and never caught on? And he specifies modern-ish, not including rimfire or pinfire. Well, that leaves out a big batch of the definitely very funky rounds, which are some of the things developed around Roland White. Um, but if we're looking at just the more modern stuff, um, the various U.S. Army Salvo um, and SPEW projects where they're trying to get burst fire or multiple projectile uh, cartridges, those things have some pretty weird stuff going on. Um, there are examples of, for example, a, car a cartridge that has its combustion chamber offset from the actual projectile. Um, they made a single shot version of that. They also made a triplex version where there were actually three projectiles that would be fired in three independent barrels mounted together with the powder charge kind of down below them so that the, you, the hot gas didn't directly hit the bullet. It kind of had to go through this chamber first, which in theory would, re would make things a little bit less chaotic, uh, make things a little more predictable and uniform in the firing, maybe... Um, that didn't really go anywhere. Um, let's see, other other weird rounds. The flèche rounds or flèchette rounds uh, were experimented with, uh, sometimes with um, 
sabos on the front, something that would hold a, a small diameter projectile inside a larger bore. There have been experiments with uh, uh, polymer cased ammunition. The problem is all of this stuff ultimately suffers from two problems. It may be a benefit in one area. For example, if you've got your powder charge offset from your actual chamber, you may actually improve accuracy and barrel life by reducing uh, you know, the amount of, slightly reducing the heat of the gas that's actually hitting the throat of the barrel. However, you're trading off a whole bunch of other things. All of a sudden, the entire, everything about the gun and the feed system has to be redesigned to use this new cartridge. And that's often something that people aren't willing to pay for, whether those people are a military force or the civilian market. Um, actually, another one that comes to mind are some of the electronic cartridges that have been introduced, which have a bunch of benefits to them. Uh, very much reduced lock time. If you have an electronic trigger, all of a sudden you can get you can program exactly what trigger weight you want. You, you're not dependent on uh, sear interactions and mechanical friction and all that sort of stuff. If you want a three ounce trigger, have a three ounce trigger. It's all just based on weight on an electronic firing sensor. Uh, however, that has the trade-off of people look at it and they say, well, what if I can't find the ammunition? What if enough people don't buy this gun and the company stops making them and then the ammunition stops getting made and then I can't get ammunition. So because that might happen, I won't bother buying the gun in the first place. After all, I already have a pretty good trigger in my other rifle or this other rifle that I could buy instead that uses conventional ammo. Same thing with a military force, except on a larger scale. They may have tens or hundreds of thousands of a particular firearm, and all of a sudden someone comes up with this really unique and unusual idea that, yes, gives them some sort of concrete but limited benefit, let's say better accuracy or less fouling or better barrel life, but at the cost of a tremendous dollar value of replacing a whole ton of existing equipment. That sort of thing just is a really hard sell. Uh, it's much easier to do that when there's something else. Well, you need a, a better trade-off uh, balance of, of pros and cons to the gun or the ammunition to really entice someone to actually buy it. And, for example, rimfire and centerfire cartridges did that. There were so many advantages to a rimfire cartridge over a muzzle loader that people were willing to be early adopters of the technology. Large-scale militaries were willing to adopt it despite the huge cost of replacing all their guns. Right, from Ian H. Good name. Uh, you have often brought up past military weapons trials in your videos. What are your thoughts on the entrance and the methods of the current U.S. military MHS, modular handgun uh, something, uh, competition? To be honest, I haven't paid a whole lot of attention to it. Uh, it honestly, to me, seems kind of like a tempest in a teapot. Um, the military is looking at adopting, the U.S. military, I should say, is looking at adopting a new standard handgun because they've had their Beretta 92s for a very long time and the guns are getting worn out. And if you're going to be rebuilding or replacing all the guns in inventory, here's a situation where they're spending the money anyway. Maybe there is something that's better and it doesn't necessarily have to be fundamentally better to be worth buying because you're going to be paying effectively to replace all the guns anyway. So, yeah, let's take a look at what the other options are. That being said, I don't honestly see a whole lot of difference between most of the service pistols out there. I think they all pretty much do the same thing just as well as each other. They all have little minor advantages and disadvantages compared to each other, but I don't see anything really particularly groundbreaking coming out of this competition, no matter who wins it. So... Um, and on top of that, the handgun in a military sense, especially today, is not a particularly important weapon. Um, it's something that is there more as a just-in-case and as a, a status symbol sort of thing. And just because you don't want to necessarily leave people totally unarmed, so you'll give them a handgun, but the chances that they'll actually use it are pretty tiny. Yes, I know they do occasionally get used, but it's far less significant than an infantry rifle, far less significant than, say, anti-tank or anti-aircraft missile systems. Any number of things are a lot more important and uh, relevant than military handguns these days. So for that reason, I haven't really looked. They may come up with something that's slightly more modular. Okay. Um, yeah. 
see. From Jordan W., a two-part question. Part one, what gun designer do you feel deserves more credit than they got for their accomplishments in small arms uh, development? And this is a subject where I, I need to, I want to find out more because I've seen whispers at this and, and bits of it here and there, but I've never really taken the time to hammer down exactly all some of the, the more interesting details. The, the people actually that I would, I would put up for this who deserves more credit are the guys who worked for some of the companies that John Browning had contracts with, especially Winchester, who actually did a substantial amount of work taking his patents and adapting them for actual mass production. Winchester bought dozens of Browning patents. Now, they didn't manufacture all of them, but the ones that they did, Browning didn't necessarily give them tooling and uh, a design that was optimized for mass production on whatever tools Winchester might have at the time. And it was the responsibility of Winchester's in-house engineering teams to take a really good idea and turn it into a really good product. And you can totally make or break a gun that way. Uh, for example, the Colt All-American 2000, by all accounts, really was a quite good gun in the hands of Reed Knight and Eugene Stoner, who patented the, the essential features of it. Once they turned it over to Colt to manufacture, a lot of changes got made because, again, this is a, it's a handmade, basically, prototype. And now, okay, here are the tools we have. We need to optimize this so that we can get the best profit margins on it, keep the price as low as possible. And they really kind of screwed the pooch when they did that process with the All-American 2000. It turned into a kind of crummy gun. But it didn't start that way. In the same vein, you've got ideas that come from John Browning that are sometimes revolutionary, sometimes just very good ideas. Someone has to actually take that, turn it into a product, and get the best efficient engineering out of it while not losing the core of what made it a good idea in the first place. And I would, I, I want to do some more reading and find out who those guys were and what some of their backgrounds were, and it would be very interesting to talk to them. Now, the second part of this question kind of elaborates on this. Um, if you could get an interview with any gun designer, past or present, who would it be and why? And kind of on a related note, now there are, it's hard to come up with a gun designer I would turn down an opportunity to interview. Um, picking one would be difficult, however, uh, it would be very interesting to uh, have a language barrier overcome and have a chance to speak to Dudion Saif. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right with a terrible American accent. He was uh, basically Browning's sort of apprentice at FN. And when John Browning died, Saif uh, took over as the head of firearms development for FN. And in that position, he is responsible for a couple of the really, the, the, the classic guns that we still see in use extensively today that were great guns in their own right. They may have some of their origins in some of Browning's work, but of course, almost everything does. Uh, those two guns specifically being the Browning High Power Pistol and the FN FAL Rifle. Um, those were both developed, finalized, produced under the, uh, the, the work, under the uh, oversight of Doudonné Saif. So, I particularly like the FAL. It's a fantastic gun. It is well regarded as the right arm of the free world been used by about a gazillion countries, still in extensive use today, although possibly not frontline military use, but uh, it'd be really interesting to talk to him both about his own work and about his experience working with John Browning. Um, in some ways, I think you can learn more about a person by speaking to those around them than by speaking directly to them. And uh, it'd be fascinating, I think, to, to hear an account of Browning from some of the people who were closest to him. Next up, from Terry B. How do I feel, how do y'all feel, about import marks on so-called collectible firearms? Is it okay since you're going to shoot them anyway, or a big turnoff and a deal breaker? Um, my initial reaction to this was, well, import marks are kind of always a negative. What, how, how much of a negative varies, uh, but they're never a good thing. Then on the other hand, when, once an import mark gets old enough, it kind of takes on an interesting value of its own. Um, for example, there are a lot of British guns out there 
uh, which had to be reproofed. It's not quite an import mark, but they had to be reproofed to be sold on the British commercial market. So you have guns, let's just say, for example, Lugers, that, yeah, they were proofed by the Germans when they were made, but when they were, say, brought back to England as war trophies, and then someone decided they wanted to sell that pistol, they had to go down to the Birmingham Proof House and have it reproofed. So now it's got the German marks, and it's got this, at the time, you know, stupid, pointless, unnecessary, and ugly Birmingham proof on the gun as well. well today, now that gives us some insight into the history of this thing and where it actually went. Now, we know this thing went through England at some point. So in some ways, eventually a proof mark becomes an interesting added element to a gun's history. Um, some of them are, are more obnoxious than others. Obviously, the the legal requirements for, say, location and size of import marks have changed over the years. Some of the modern, the, the more modern requirements really are kind of like giant ugly billboards on the sides of guns where they used to be much more discreet. I think it's kind of dumb to require the really ugly billboard markings. Proof marks on military, sur or, uh, import marks on military surplus guns are not something that's particularly necessary or useful to law enforcement. Um, and if someone's going to deface them, they're going to deface them, whether they're big or small. So don't typically like them. If I can, given the choice of a gun with one and, and the same gun without one, I will always take the gun without one. But often you don't really have a choice. Um, an interesting example would be a lot of the guns that came out of Spain had to be import marked um, because they were purchased after 1968. But Spain had a lot of weird, interesting stuff that they had collected over many decades. And there, there are plenty of guns out there where the only examples in the U.S. are from Spain. They were imported and import marked as such. And if you want that gun, okay, you can either have it with an import mark or you can not have it at all. So in that case, you take what you can get. From Zachary E., I've read a few articles about field or soldier modifications to weapons during World War II that went beyond things like just removing the bipod on the BAR. One that comes to mind was attaching a BAR magazine to a 1903 Springfield to increase magazine capacity. Have you come across other examples of soldier-made field modifications to weapons, or weapons that had evidence of repaired field modifications? Yes. Um, not really all that often, but it is absolutely something that happened and that you can find examples of. Um, probably the most high-profile example in the U.S. military is the Stinger which was a Browning aircraft gun. Actually, they, I think they made six of them originally. Um, salvaged aircraft Brownings, which are very high rate of fire guns. They're intended to be air-cooled um, on, say, torpedo bomber or dive bomber gun turrets. Well, there were some guys in the Pacific Theater who were kind of bored doing nothing, salvaged some of these guns from damaged or destroyed U.S. aircraft, and then affixed M1 Garand buttstocks to them uh, and turned the... And, trigger assembly linkages, and turned them into like 1,200 round per minute sort of light machine guns, heavy light machine guns. Um, and ooh, I ought to know the guy's name, and I can't remember it offhand. Uh, one of the men involved in that program actually won a Medal of Honor on one of the Pacific Islands for actions where he was using one of these machine guns that was basically of his own manufacture. It was never something approved by the military at large, Never something developed by the Ordnance Department. It was entirely done by a couple of sergeants, basically, uh, in the armory who had a lot of free time on their hands and some extra parts to play with. So you've got that at the one end. Um, the idea of affixing extended magazines does definitely happen pretty much everywhere. You'll occasionally see the rumors or, or examples of uh, Arasakas with Nambu light machine gun magazines fitted on them. Um, a lot of that is post-war you know, U.S. ownership, uh, people doing that, but I, I'm reasonably certain that some of it was done in the field by Japanese troops. Um, and then I have actually this cool example myself. This is a Walther G41, uh, one of the early German self-loading rifles of World War II. What's interesting about this is I've got a ZF-41, this is a reproduction, ZF-41 optic on it, these G41 rifles had, they were made with an optics mounting rail. However, the, the optics mounting was done after the development of the mounting system, was done after the rifles were going into production. By the time they actually finished and were ready to start producing and shipping out and issuing 
uh, scope mounts for these uh, G41s, the G41 was obsolete. They were replacing with the G43. So they ended up scrapping the program. And few, if any, of these, they're kind of like a saddle mount that goes over the whole rear sight block. Few, if any, of those actually got produced and issued in the field. However, they were issuing in substantial numbers uh, ZF41 scopes with a side mount rail that could be modified in the field and added to a CAR 98K Mauser. And what someone did on this rifle, and I've seen pictures of other examples, um, so this, this is certainly not a one-of-a-kind thing, but it's, there weren't a lot of them. Someone, some uh, armor sergeant uh, took one of these K98K mounting rails and welded it onto the side of the, uh, the rear sight on this G41, thus allowing the addition of a ZF41 optic to the rifle. And you can tell on here, it's it, the thing was just welded onto the side. It's not a particularly nice weld. But then the finish matches everything else on the gun. And like I said, I've seen period pictures of these. There's no reason to believe this was done aftermarket by anybody. It's just an example of that. It's We've got all these scope mounts. We've got these scopes. And I've got this self-loading rifle. And boy, wouldn't it be cool if I could put that scope on that rifle. And so Hans or... Fritz fires up the welder, and there you go. Presto, we've got it. Does create a couple of issues here. Uh, the scope's actually a little bit too far back. Um, on the original saddle mount, the scope would have been a little bit farther forward. As it is, it has the potential to interfere with stripper clip loading in the rifle. But uh, whoever did this in the field obviously was willing to make that trade-off. I don't blame them. It's a really cool rifle with that scope on it. All right, next up, from John H. It uh, says, the 30-06 military cartridge was replaced with some fanfare by the 762 by 51 cartridge. Are, th are there any special advantages of the newer round over the older? Seems like a lot of trouble to no avail. I would tend to agree. Um, there may be some ammo specialists out there who would take a different answer to this, but as far as I know, there really is no substantial improvement of 7.62 NATO over 30-06. Um, the whole point ballistically was to match the 30 6 They made the cartridge about a quarter inch shorter. You went from 63 millimeter to 51. Uh, it's actually almost half an inch. Uh, but beyond that, no, not really. Uh, from BR Waldo. Hi, Ian and Carl. Uh, Carl's not here. I'll just take this one myself. Uh, if you had the choice to go back and save a small arms development program from being cancelled when it was, or from following the path that it did and instead go with the original or another proposed plan, which one would you do and why? What impact do you think saving these projects would have had on arms development uh, and the world as it was at the time? Well, the two that come to mind, uh, the first one is the French self-loading rifle development before World War I. Um, the best thing that they had come up with, which actually was formally adopted but never produced, was the A6 Munier rifle uh, in a 7mm proprietary cartridge. By all accounts, those are really quite fantastic rifles. Um, at least a small number of them were manufactured in World War I, something like a thousand guns. But, you know, proprietary cartridge, fancy complex semi-auto rifle, they were never going to make a whole lot of those things once World War I started. They, there was not nearly enough money and way too much demand for anything that could shoot bullets uh, for a self-loading rifle to come into development at that point. However, if you could set aside World War I and continue that development program, it would be interesting to see what came of it. Would it fundamentally change anything? I doubt it. Um, there were other self-loading rifles that were in development at that point. Obviously, the Mondragon had already been adopted um, some years previously. The U.S. at that point was looking at, well, everyone was looking at self-loading rifles. Um, whether, a, you know, if the French had adopted a self-loading rifle in, say, 1920, uh, without World War I getting in the way, yeah, it would have been interesting to see what they had. Fundamentally changed the world? No, probably not. The U.S. was already on the path to doing that, as were the Soviets, as were the Germans, really. But it'd be an interesting thing. Uh, the other one that would be maybe have more of an impact today would be to take the, uh, the development of the FAL, that guy, and take the, uh, the American insistence on 7.62 NATO out of the program. 
I have actually handled early prototype FALs in 8 Kurtz and in 30 Carbine, and they're really nice rifles. Kind of like the M1s in 276. They're smaller, they're lighter, they're handier than the final product that we ended up getting. And I think if you could avoid... It, it, it might have been very interesting to take all of the 762 NATO development and throw it away and bypass it and actually go to something closer to an intermediate cartridge right after World War II. Soviets did it and it worked quite well for them. Uh, I think it probably would have worked well for NATO and the US as well. From Jason M, uh, what current production firearms do you think one day will become forgotten weapons? Uh, he suggests that the USFA zip gun comes to mind. Uh, the sooner that thing becomes forgotten, the better off we will all be. And there's a lot of other kind of junk on the market like that. Uh, I would put the Heiser double tap guns and Pocket AR, Pocket AK. It kind of hurts me to even say those names. Uh, all of that stuff will definitely go away and uh, remain with us only as a laughable memory. Now, the, inter the more interesting take on this that that I can't help thinking about is when we look today at, for example, people who collect Mausers, there's a gazillion different Mausers out there to look at from every single different country that Mauser contracted with and all the different variants, you know, countries with the, the short rifles and the carbines and the artillery carbines and the long rifles and this and that and a special version for the rural police. And there are people who very seriously, very legitimately, and I get it and I can appreciate it, collect all these different variants. Well, the, the the equivalent to that today is, in many ways, like the AR-15. How many different manufacturers are there of AR-15 rifles and lowers? And consider that in 50 or 100 years, there are probably going to be people out there interested in trying to collect all the different versions of the ARs, because they've all got different markings on them. And this one has a flared lower, and this one has a more flared lower, and this one's got an extended uh, trigger guard, and this one has that, and that one has that, and you've got the really weird variants, like the, the what, Cobalt Kinetics thing that automatically dumped magazines when they were empty, and all of the different caliber conversions. Uh, you know, this one's set up for 9mm, this one was set up for 45, this one was made out of this alloy, this one was made out of, you know, 6061 instead of 7075. It, it's interesting to consider that Given enough time, there are going to be people who are as interested in collecting all of those as we are today in collecting, say, all the different variants of Mauser. So, not that I'm suggesting you should buy them all today, because, well, no, check that. I don't think you ever would make a substantial amount of money by getting a really awesome universal collection of AR-15s. I think that's a, that's a losing game. I think even if you'd done that with Mausers back, you know, at the turn of this last century, you probably wouldn't have made an actual income on it. All right, next up, uh, we are getting close to the end here. Christian H. Uh, my question is a two-part question, once again. All right, we'll take these one at a time. Uh, how did your father become interested in Japanese firearms of World War II? Uh, so much that he was on Tales of the Gun for their Japanese episode and wrote his own book on the subject. He did? Um, yeah, my, I got my introduction to guns largely from my father, who collected... Uh, Japanese World War II rifles and pistols. And the reason he was specifically interested in those is my father was actually born on the island of Saipan. Uh, my grandfather was stationed there at the time in the 1950s. And uh, so my dad grew up doing some shooting and interested in shooting. And when he decided to take up gun collecting, uh, he had this interest in Japanese arms because of where he'd been born. So, uh, in fact, he actually brought this... Uh, piece of shell fragment back for me from a time when we went back and visited Saipan. Uh, second part of the question, with uh, relation to Japanese arms, how come the ammunition for these guns is so difficult to come by while the rifles and pistols are so relatively cheap? Good question. Uh, there are a lot of Arasakas in the United States. Uh, they made, I believe it was in total about two and a half million uh, Type 99s? I probably should have checked my numbers exactly before I sat down for filming, but at any rate, millions of Arasakas were made, and an awful lot of them came back as souvenirs into the U.S. Um, there were, of course, guns that were literally captured in combat. But then every soldier that went over there as part of the occupation, you know, in 45 and 46 and later, those guys wanted souvenirs. You know, hey, I'm, here I am serving in Japan. 
I'm, by God, I'm gonna go home with some cool Japanese gun. And there were factories full of guns, and there were stockpiles. There, there are pictures of these things, just mountains of surrendered, captured guns. And most of them were destroyed, but hey, they're available for souvenirs if you want one. That was a common practice at the time that is no longer uh, an option for today's combat vets. At any rate, yes, a ton of those came home uh, to the U.S. However, the 6.5 and 7.7 Japanese rifle cartridges had no prior history in the U.S. They were never used by any other countries or guns. Uh, the Arasakas were, were, really, were never sold on the commercial market in a sporting form, so while you might buy sporting rifles in, say, 7mm Mauser, you, there were no options for sporting rifles prior to World War II in 6.5 or 7.7 Japanese. So none of the ammunition companies had any reason to ever tool up for them until the war ends. And uh, when all of these guns do come back, what a lot of guys do, because of course at the end of the war these companies still aren't making Japanese ammo, they're maybe making a ton of American ammo. Uh, so what a lot of vets do if they want to actually shoot the guns is they rechamber them uh, for something else. For example, uh, the 6.5 Japanese was often recut, the chambers were recut into uh, 257 Roberts. Same bore diameter, larger cartridge, so you can just ream out the chamber a little bit, and presto, you can just use 257, which is in production and you can buy. Um, conversions like that were often made, and there were a lot of vets who had no real interest in shooting these things. It was it was a trophy, it hang on, supposed to hang on the wall and look cool and remind you of of your service. Now there was ammunition made uh, sporadically, and there still is today. But it really has been an issue of the only guns that are ever going to use these cartridges are brought back trophies, and there was never a huge amount of demand for it. So the pistols are in the same boat, but more so than the rifles. Fewer pistols came over, and there was a lot less demand for ammo to use in them. If you bring back a trophy rifle, yeah, and then you live in rural Pennsylvania or out in the West, absolutely, you can take that thing and go hunting with it you're not going to go hunting with a Type 14 Nambu pistol. So that whole segment of demand for ammunition wasn't there. Um, 8 Nambu has, I think, always been a difficult cartridge to get for that reason. Uh, in fact, it's not unique in that way. If you look at a lot of the other, say, the European handgun cartridges, uh, the 8mm French Ordnance Revolver, the 7.5 Swiss Ordnance Revolver, those kind of cartridges are also extremely difficult to get because there was really never any substantial demand for it here in the U.S. All right, Nathan G. This is actually a question I've gotten a lot, and I've touched on answers other places, but we'll give it another treatment here. Uh, question on latex slash rubber gloves when handling old weapons. A lot of the documentaries about guns, the old History Channel ones are a good example, showed the handlers of antique firearms using latex gloves to theoretically keep the oils from their hand off the guns. On one side, I get that these are guns that have been handled by bare hands and exposed to much worse over the course of 50, 100, or 200 years. Ideally, they also have a nice coat of oil that has been dried up and or maintained over the years. On the other hand, I've seen unfinished steel get, without protection, get rust fingerprinting after or only, day, only days after being handled. So why no gloves? Um, there are a couple reasons for that. So as a general rule, um, I use gloves when my host uses gloves. So if I'm at a museum and when and their policy is to use gloves, uh, either rubber or cotton sometimes, I happily do so and I understand why. However, um, there are a substantial number of private collectors and um, as I'm sure you've seen, the, the major auction houses do not, as a matter of policy, do not wear gloves when they handle guns. The reason for that, there are a couple reasons. So. First off, a substantial amount of the glove requirement comes from the world of the museum, where usually what you're dealing with are artifacts that are both more fragile and older than modern firearms. If you're handling 500-year-old manuscripts, absolutely you want to wear gloves. At least I would, I'm assuming. And this mindset kind of takes hold in the museum world that when you're handling artifacts, you wear gloves to protect them and it makes sense, and that extends to the guns. Um, however, guns aren't really all that fragile. Yes, it's possible if you're in the wrong environment that you have something in the white and you get a big smudgy fingerprint on it and it will rust in a few days. However, most of the time when you're in a place that has a substantial value of firearms, 
they have humidity controls, they have temperature controls. You're going to make sure to, and I do, you know, take good care of your hands. You're not going to have, uh, you know, I'm not going to go eat a pile of french fries and then come back and start handling really rare guns. You make sure your hands are reasonably clean. You get, you'll, you'll see my hands in especially some of the auction videos where I've got uh, dirt and grease on them, and that's stuff that came out of the inside of these same guns. It's not going to hurt them. Um, and when we're done, typically we wipe down the guns. Um, the auction houses, these guns are being rehandled by a lot of people. Um, they're catalogers, and then people like me, and then the cataloger again when they go to get it to answer a question that someone asks them. And then when they have the uh, the open house before the auction, every, everybody in the world is welcome to come in and handle the guns and look at them. And the, what damage you might legitimately get from this sort of handling isn't going to happen in that time frame. And so they look at that, and then they consider uh, how likely are we, if we're using cotton gloves, to oops, slip and drop something, uh, or rubber gloves that may get some sweat or condensation on them and you get the same problem. And a lot of places consider that that risk outweighs the potential damage from barehanded handling, especially when the guns are typically cleaned up later on. And even if not, they're going to a private collector who then has the onus of responsibility on them to clean something up before they put it in their own collection. Um, I think that pretty well covers that one. So, yeah, whenever I'm in a place where the owner or curator requests uh, gloves, absolutely, I'm happy to do it. In my own collection, honestly, I don't bother. Um, for me personally, it's a huge hassle and just one I don't want to deal with. And I have never really seen any detrimental effect from handling guns without gloves. Uh, let's see. One last one from Frank M. Um, my grandfather uh, was part of a heavy machine gun squad in the Austro-Hungarian Army on the Russian front from 1914 to 1916. Yeah, I do not envy your grandfather that experience. Uh, what weapon were they using? That's a pretty simple one. That, assuming they weren't using something captured, the official Austro-Hungarian main issue heavy machine gun was the Schwabslosa model of 1917-1912. Uh, it was an interesting uh, blowback actuated. It did not have an actual locking mechanism in it. It's a blowback machine gun in 8x50 rimmed, uh, water-cooled, tripod mounted, and I actually have a full video I did on it at the James Julia Auction House a little while back. So if you're interested in more on that gun, you can check out that video now. That's going to wrap up all the questions I have for today before my voice goes totally hoarse. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, if you would like to have your own question thrown into the mix uh, next month when I do this again, please consider joining up and uh, helping to contribute to my Patreon account. As I've said, that is what allows me to do much of what I do, and it is very much appreciated. So thanks for watching. Tune in again, and as always, enjoy Forgotten Weapons.